Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon, episode 59, Talleyrand, Foreign Minister of France. Before we begin, if you've been enjoying the previous episodes of this podcast, we invite you to go to patreon.com forward slash generals and Napoleon, where you can support us with a small donation. We have a $5 a month option or a $10 a month option available, and we truly appreciate all support. Now, on with the show. I have a very special guest joining us on today is a professor emeritus from Oxford, Michael Brewers, who has written several books on the period, including one I just finished, Napoleon, The Decline and Fall of an Empire. Michael, how are you? Fine. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me on. We are going to talk about a fascinating guy today, um, Foreign Minister Talleyrand, correct? Yep. And what did you, th- like, thumbnail sketch, what do we, I mean, I know there's a general opinion of Talleyrand that he was kind of a scoundrel, but he was also a brilliant guy. What is your kind of, like, thumbnail sketch of this this person? Talleyrand was a very bright man, um, very well connected. He was a, he was a superb operator. Mm-hmm. I think he was one of the most overrated diplomats really this period okay but when it comes to internal politics in france he was the sharpest operator on the street interesting because you're right there were a lot of uh, uh great statesmen in the era metternich and uh, uh yeah. you know uh, a yeah. few ca- castle ray there was a bunch out there for sure yeah. the other the other thing about him the caricature of him is he was the great survivor mm-hmm. and i think that's absolutely true Mm-hmm. You know, that, that guy navigated all the choppy waters of a very choppy period mm-hmm. and came up smelling of roses in the end. Yeah. And sir, uh, you know, and so he really does fit that that um, nickname he was given of the great survivor. Indeed. Yeah. Well, let's jump in. Um, he was born February 1754 in Paris to an aristocratic family, although not a particularly wealthy one. And um, I know he had some health issues growing up uh, due to his club foot. Mm. Was that a congenital defect or did he injure himself? I know there's been many stories. It's all, a, well, I hesitate to issue an opinion on it mm-hmm. because it is all sort of shrouded in a kind of a family silence. It's not the sort of thing families talk about. Whether there was some sort of um, problem when he was born when there was some sort of um, injury, accident, it would have been when he was quite young. Mm-hmm. Uh, you are very young. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's just hard to know. Yeah. Um, it, it really is hard to know. Yeah. But it does affect his life chances, even as an aristocrat. It does shape his whole career. So he joins the clergy, which is usually, you have one of two careers as an aristocrat. Um, That's right. Yeah. And... Um, he does, he becomes well-educated. He ends up studying theology until the age of 21 and allegedly witnesses the coronation of King Louis XVI in 1775. He is definitely a smart man, but do you think he was genius level or do you think he was just more, like you said earlier, like a survivor like uh, Marshall Bernadotte? He was very sharp, uh, shrewd observer, obviously very good with people. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not sure what a genius is. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm not sure how you define it. Yeah. But I don't think when it when it comes to the particular, there is a very sharp man. Yeah. yeah he the, knows the world around him. He knows France. Yeah. He knows the political and property classes, the upper classes of that country. You can read them like a book. Mm-hmm. Um, although he, I can see him so often as a foreign minister getting out of his depth. Right. Um, And I think it's hard to see him as the very first rank. Uh, When you compare him in some ways to Napoleon, in some ways to Metternich, Mm -hmm. um, in some ways to to Tsar Alexander. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are the big guns, Castlereagh. Yep. These are the great minds of the period. Right. You know, who, who really have a grip on their own times and the future. I'm not quite sure Tally was at that level. 
but in a crisis, mm. he really can, I think, keep a clear-eyed vision and not panic. Yeah, because yeah. He, he's not—he's a man of the 18th century. Yeah, he's not driven by passion; he's driven by calculation. Right, but they don't. I, but his calculations don't always add up. Right, and it, you know, people say, "Oh, he had a silver tongue; he always mm. knew how to flatter." And I think he just chose his words very carefully. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, well, he becomes ordained as a priest at age 25 and kind of works his way up and actually becomes a bishop in 1789. But during the French Revolution, he kind of displays his first ability to shift with the tides and currents of the populace, like you were talking earlier. He kind of had his, his fingers on the pulse of the uh, public, and he supports the anti-clericalism of the revolutionaries. Um, it seems like he was just always on, able to sit on the right side of the fence as opposed to the end up on the chopping block of the guillotine, don't you think? Well, yes and no. Mm -hmm. One of the things about Tally Roll's early career in the church is it's not really a career. An awful lot of French aristocrats went into the church, um, but they didn't serve as churchmen. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a sinecure for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tally Roll, I think it's, it's fair to say, I think there's enough evidence we have that can say, Talley won't barely you how to say a mass. <laughs> and he hardly ever did, but he was not alone. Right. Um, there's a guy, I'll just pick out a couple of examples for you. All the big guns of the late Ancien Regime, almost all of Louis XVI's ministers, guy called Calon, guy called Brienne, um, they, were, they were clergy. Mm -hmm. They themselves were high-ranking clergymen and that's the last thing they did. You know, they were ministers of state. They were prime ministers. Mm -hmm. Brienne was the um, the president of the estates of Languedoc. Languedoc was like a devolved regional parliament. And Brienne was like its first minister. Mm -hmm. You know, he was its chairman. And then he becomes Louis XVI's controller general, like a prime minister. And he succeeded Calonne, right. who was a career civil servant. Right. You know, this guy was a Beltway player, mm -hmm. you would say nowadays. He was clergy, but I mean, he didn't know anything about the church. <laughs> Neither did Talleyron. Right. They had guys called Vickers General who did the work for them, you know, while they held the title. I mean, Talleyron was, became the Bishop of Autun, which is a beautiful town in Burgundy, actually, with a, a beautiful uh, Romanesque cathedral. My wife and I used to spend Easter, Easter weekend there for years and years, we used to. Mm -hmm. And but Talleyrand never only set foot there twice, like a lot of aristocrats. Um, he's pretty good at riding the early tide, but I mean, as as you know, yeah, uh, at the height of the terror period, you know, from sort of 94, so well, it starts in 92, 93, mm -hmm. and he manages to keep out of the way. Mm -hmm. But 94, when it got really rough, Talleyrand has gone, he's in America, yeah, thank god. Um, yeah, he, he spent a couple of years in the states and kept his head completely low and out of the way yeah and just to give some background on that in 1792 he goes to london to help avert war with the british and then right. from 1794 he's forced to leave england yeah um because you know war starting to heat up between france yeah, and england right. and he goes to the united states until 1796 yeah um uh, do you think he learns a lot in both places probably i mean he probably just sees how two different styles of government are run in both places he learned an enormous amount in England, mm -hmm. enormous amount. Um, and so did actually quite a few other Frenchmen mm -hmm. uh, at the time. And I think the message they take away from both England and America is, don't try this at home. <laughs> you know, they have their own ways of doing things. Right. And it's, it works for them. But God, you couldn't do that here. Right. right. You, know, you just could not do that here because... You know, I think this is the conservative instinct in it, especially in, in, in when he's in, in London. You know, this has come out of hundreds of years mm -hmm. of developing on its own, their habits, they have their own ways of thinking and working, and it just wouldn't work like that here. Right. You know, it just, it just we're not like that. We don't have those traditions. We have different traditions. With the revolution, we, we, we're trying to get away from tradition altogether. Yeah. You, you can't do that. In America, they've got away from tradition, but it's a completely different environment. 
you know, it's just a completely different environment out there. And um, he's interesting. He's one of only two guys I know. Talleyrand's one, and Alexis de Tocqueville, who's a generation younger. Yep. You know, he's two generations after. He's, he's born about 1800. Tocqueville, Tocqueville. yeah. They're, but they're the only ones who come home and say, that the, the general view of America is that this was Europe in its infancy. Mm-hmm. You know, this was Europe emerging from the Dark Ages that you're seeing in America. Mm-hmm. Talleyrand says, no, it's not. Tocqueville and Talleyrand, the only two guys I know who say it. Right. This is not yesterday. This is tomorrow. Right. Sooner or later, Europe is going to become like America. Interesting. It's not that America is going to become like Europe. It won't. We will become like them. Yeah. Now, that is scary. Yeah. But it's going to happen. And I think he imparts a certain amount of that to Napoleon. Yeah. And he was kind because of... Napoleon has a remarkable attribute that he's, I don't think, ever given credit for. He says, look, we live in times of incredible change. And the only thing we know about tomorrow is that we don't know what tomorrow is going to be like. Right. All we know is it's going to be different from today. Yeah. Because yeah. the rate of change, Napoleon, because he had a scientific education, mm-hmm. he, one of the few guys who did, formally educated in the sciences, he was saying, look, if you guys understood optics, you would know that one day they're not going to just be powerful telescopes, they're going to be powerful microscopes. You know, vaccination, everybody's got to be vaccinated. Right. Because it comes from things we can't see. Yeah. And, and, we know we know what prevents it. We've seen that we can do it. And Tallyroll now Tallyroll doesn't have any of that background, as you said yourself. Right. Very traditional education. But that's what I think what he learns in America that that you know it's not going to be like it used to be, and that's why he's always trying to look ahead. Yeah, yeah. I always felt Napoleon was ahead of the curve, both militarily and and certainly in marketing, the way he used his bullets oh, to yeah. mark, market his empire. But uh, oh yeah. yeah. Talleyrand, but ta- sure. where it comes in with Talleyrand, I'm jumping ahead of everything sure, we're talking fine. about, but comes in at the end, you know, when, he's, when they're looking at the restoration, mm. when Napoleon's gone, mm-hmm. and Talleyrand is, is one of the ones, and he is disliked for it mm-hmm. by a lot of people, but says the, the, the people who really agree with them are Alexander, it's our Alexander, Castlereagh, and Wellington, that you know, you cannot, you can't put you know, Humpty Dumpty back together again. <laughs> right. You know, you, you can't put the old regime back. Right. You've got to move on. Now, you've got to do so cautiously. Right. You were saying, I am not a revolutionary reformer. I am not a Jacobin. I am not a Democrat. You know, I'm not a radical person. <laughs> but you can't go back to the way it was. Right. Yeah, you can't turn back the clock, for sure. You can't turn back the clock. That's something, the glue that held Napoleon and Talleyrand together for a long time. Yeah. It's, it maybe, maybe it would be great if we could go back, but yeah. there's no way. Yeah, well, let, let's talk about how they met. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Talleyrand returns to France in 1797. He becomes foreign minister. Um, and during this time, uh, kind of 1798, 1799, he allies himself with the rising star that is Napoleon. Did the two men get along initially? Um, they went through different periods. I think at first they did. Mm-hmm. Talleyrand gets to know Napoleon through Napoleon's older brother, Joseph, because Talleyrand's never lost his links when he was in America. Mm-hmm. You know, he's remarkable at keeping his eye on things. When he comes back, it's really Joseph who he gets to know first, because Joseph is a, a wheeler dealer, bit shady, mover and shaker, but very... He's a very smooth operator, Joseph. Mm-hmm. And he and Tally won't get on because basically because they're a couple of smoothies. Right. <laughs> and yeah, but they they're trying to, in a wartime situation, um, keep the government, the directory the government's called at that time, trying to keep the wheels on, trying to keep the channels open. Mm-hmm. And it's through Joseph really that he gets to that he gets to know Napoleon. He doesn't have much to do with Napoleon directly mm-hmm. uh, in 96, 97, because if through other contacts, Napoleon becomes commander of the army of Italy. Right. And goes off and has his great successes in Italy and makes his, his first great name for himself. Mm-hmm. But Talleyrand's got to know him. And 
you know, they stay in touch and uh, often through Joseph. Mm -hmm. And the first time you really see them working together, 1798, the director want to get Napoleon out of Italy because mm -hmm. Napoleon's turning it into his own fief. You know, right, right. he's built his own power base there. Yep. And so there's a, a sort of tentative peace talks going on at a place called Rastatt in Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they send Napoleon there as a kind of a French ambassador parachuted in. Mm -hmm. And through Joseph, Talleyrand kind of chats with Napoleon and kind of sends him with a brief and they find that they're of a mind. Napoleon's only there a few days, but it's crucial because Talleyrand says to him, look, all the small German princes are there. And there's one guy from a small principality, Max Joseph, and he is the son of the Elector of Bavaria, who's, mm -hmm. which is the biggest of the small states, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And get to know him. He's a good guy. Mm -hmm. All these guys are potentially pro-French because they're afraid of Austria and Prussia. Right. And Napoleon goes in there, he gets to know them. You know, and this is the guy who's just beaten the Austrians. He's got the confidence to say to them, look, France can protect you. Right. Austria can't. Mm -hmm. Think about changing sides. And he meets Max Joseph and they become allies and they're loyal. Max Joseph is loyal to him right up to 1813 and only very reluctantly changes sides in 1813. Mm -hmm. He becomes Napoleon's best ally. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's through Talleyrand there. And when he comes out of there, Talleyrand is, is very much impressed by him. You know, this guy has a brain. He's not just a soldier. Right, right. And the next thing where they get together is actually the, the Egyptian campaign. Yes. Now, I had a, a, a brilliant student. Um, I was in touch with him just the other day. He's not an academic now. He's, he's in politics. He did a brilliant thesis for me on Talleyrand and Talleyrand's ideas on colonial policy. Mm -hmm. And as far as we can tell, the conquest of Egypt was actually Talleyrand's idea. Yeah. He, well, he certainly, what, what this guy was, this student of mine, a brilliant bloke, Leo, um, Leo, Leo Key, was able to come up with was that Talleyrand was the guy, he mightn't be the sole originator, but he's the guy who puts together the package right of saying egypt is a good idea right that he sells to the government he, he sells it to napoleon because napoleon's first you know, I, I don't want to go away from here i've you know i've got skin in this game i don't want to get the out guy out of the way right but Talleyrand convinces him no mate this is the big time yeah because yeah. what Talleyrand is thinking is we are losing mm -hmm. our foothold in america mm -hmm. we are going to lose it mm -hmm. We're hanging on now, but we're going to lose. He's farsighted in that respect. A few years yeah. ahead of the game. Yeah, yeah. We're going to lose all this because basically our Navy is not able to take it off the British in the Atlantic. Right. But it can take him on in the Med. Mm -hmm. And if you know, we can get to Egypt, Egypt will become a proper colony for France. We can grow cotton in Egypt. So we don't have to import our textiles from England anymore. You know, we can bolster our own internal you know, uh, it, all this kind of stuff, you know, there's none of this business about conquering and using the springboard to conquer in India. Right. That's a myth. Yeah. Nobody's interested in that. Yeah. But, you know, this is the way forward. Go, Napoleon, go do it. Yeah. And and, that, that's and, where they really get together for the first yeah. time. And Napoleon always saw himself as a, a Caesar or an Alexander, you know, going to, you know, Egypt and Turkey and kind of conquering those lands, kind of like his, his I guess, his role models did. A bit. I mean, he's certainly keen to be in you know, Egypt if it's going to be. You see, he's got the he's got a knack now from Italy mm -hmm. of going in somewhere that's that little bit away from Paris, mm -hmm. where nobody watches you, mm -hmm. and you create your own little kingdom there. Right. And he says, "Well, if I could do it in Italy, Egypt's even further away. Right. Yeah. I can create my own power base in Egypt." Well, of course, it doesn't work out that way. Correct. You yeah. know, but he's a bit like Marlon Brando in Apocalypse Now. You know, just get, I'll get out there myself and do it my own way. Right, right. You know, and, and I'll create my own power base here. Right. Which he does not manage to do in Egypt. It's a disaster. 
Yeah, yeah. And that then creates a very rocky relationship between Napoleon and Italian Wolf for a while. Mm, mm -hmm. you, know, you told me this was going to be all right. <laughs> you know? And it happens again 10 years later with Spain. Going into Spain initially was Talleyrand's idea. Really? Okay. Because okay. Talleyrand, again, Talleyrand's the empire builder. Mm -hmm. This is where, coming back to what we were saying earlier, where he's not a genius, he's not a visionary, he always gets the big picture wrong. Mm hmm. Because he gets, he get, but he gets into Napoleon's head. I think Talleyrand, I think Napoleon sometimes thinks he's a genius mm -hmm. and doesn't find out till it's too late that he's that he's not. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. Let's talk about that because I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that kind of question. Obviously, Napoleon comes back 1799. He makes himself first council. Talleyrand assists him, assists him it's with that effort. But uh, Napoleon, in turn, makes Talleyrand his foreign minister. But as you mentioned, the two sometimes didn't always agree on policy. Mm -hmm. Do you think he ever legitimately wanted to help Napoleon? Or was he looking out for himself slash France? Well, I think there are times when you see that have to see the two as synonymous. Mm-hmm or he wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. he, he, Napoleon doesn't so much make him a foreign minister as he keeps him as foreign minister. He's always suspicious of Talleyrand. I mean, he's not a fool. Mm -hmm. uh, but Talleyrand does help him a great deal during the military coup of Brunet. Mm -hmm. um, he, he helps him a very great deal. He's got a lot of contacts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's foreign minister, he, uh, all that sort of thing. Uh, He's got a lot of contacts inside France, mm -hmm. smooths the way. He's, he's going to be there to support him. Mm -hmm. But the, you've got to remember something. Napoleon inherits Talleyrand. Right. He doesn't, he only technically makes him foreign minister. Talleyrand is foreign minister. He stays foreign minister. Right. That's the deal. Like, like Talleyrand's alter ego is Joseph Fouché. Mm -hmm who's also a former clergyman, but from a much more working class blue collar background. Right. And he's, but he's worked his way up in the revolution. He's the other extreme. I mean, he's a hard line Jacobin. Mm -hmm. He's about as left wing as you get mm -hmm. uh, at one time, you know, but he, but he was the minister of police. Right. Under the directory. And he stays minister of police under Napoleon. And Napoleon always has, deeply suspicious eye on both of them you know i had to keep them they're the only two who were not my appointees right because they're just too powerful and too influential yeah they pull they can pull to i i can't afford to get rid of them i need them yeah it's interesting like you always hear it's like kennedy and johnson right you, you... i don't trust them i don't like them but i've got to keep them similarities you know Lucien is, is Minister of the Interior, is his brother. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if the two other consuls, Cambyses and Lebrun, um, I don't know how he got to know those two guys, but he did. Right. You know, there is, they're there, there is men. Um, you know, there, there are plenty of other, you know, guys, ministers he brings in. They're his men. I, but those I, I, two, Fouché and Talleyrand, he stuck with them. I'm glad you brought that up because people are always like, well, why didn't Napoleon put up with this these double dealing people like Fouché, Talleyrand, Bernadotte, um, and and not shoot them and line them up against the wall or put them in prison. He can't yeah. because he need they they got him elected as it were. Right. And you know he he needs them. They've got too many contacts. Mm -hmm. They've got they've got their own power basis. They're subtle men. Right. They're not sort of you know they don't build empires under his nose. If you build an empire under his nose, you're in trouble. You'll go down. Right. To the point that nobody does it, right? But that uh, nobody dares. Mm -hmm. But them, they, they, they are. They were, as they say, they came in with the wallpaper. Mm -hmm. You know, they were, they were the, the, 
the building was built around them. They were there first. Right. And there's and he's all, but he's always thinking. Yeah. This is this is part of Napoleon's longer term plan, and it extends far beyond these two men. But for him, they typify this problem. Mm -hmm. These guys represent the revolutionary generation. They're part of a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, tally wrong with his royalist leanings. Um, you know, because he was a royal ambassador. Fouché, who is very much the terrorist, mm -hmm. you know, very much the revolutionary. He was part of the guillotine brigade. The sooner I can, the sooner I can shed these guys, the better. Right. And move on to a world of my own people. But I can't do it yet. I can't. Yeah. Yeah. He was, they know it. Yeah. They know it, too. Yeah. He's not emperor yet. He's still first council with two other people. So even yeah. when he's emperor. Yeah. Their power bases don't change. Yeah. Napoleon knows, say, as far as something like the police go, I can jump up and down all I want and say, I need this done, I need this done. Fouché doesn't push the button, it doesn't happen, and I can't make him do it. Right. And Talleyrand knows everybody and everything. Interesting. You know, and I can't do without him. There's a... In 1808, when uh, Talleyrand pushes him into Spain, Mm -hmm. Because you know, uh, and he's he's not even foreign minister then. I mean, Talleyrand resigns in eighteen oh seven, but he's still got. Uh, we can go back over why he did that. Mm -hmm. But he's got tremendous influence. You know, Napoleon still doesn't think he can drop him. But there's a very shady coup attempt while Napoleon's away and coming back from Spain to um, see if they can get rid of him. They try and get Murat, his cavalry commander, who's also his brother-in-law, right, interested in taking power. And Murat, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a bit of work on Murat at the minute. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure Murat actually quite knew what was going on. <laughs> he you wasn't the I mean? brightest guy. Yeah. No, he wasn't. And I think that's why they liked him. Right. And Napoleon took the view that Murat didn't could have known what was going on. <laughs> but they knew that he, he they knew that he was out of sorts with Napoleon because he wanted to be king of Spain. And Napoleon said, No, you're not getting king of Spain. Right. You've just massacred half the population of Madrid. Right. Yeah. You, you cannot can. be king of Spain. Joseph is going to be king of Spain. Napoleon knows through his own sources that Talleyrand and Fouché were sort of behind that coup. So is that so he resigns in 1807, Talleyrand does. Yeah. Um, after his resignation, though, he starts to accept bribes from foreign powers. But was he a valuable spy? I mean, you mentioned that he knew everyone in Paris and in mm -hmm. France, which is great. But how could you trust a word from this guy? He seems kind of like a, a double agent. Well, th there are two things there that make this, I think, very interesting. In 1807, Napoleon's defeated the Prussians, defeated the Austrians in 1805, defeats the Prussians in 1806. Mm -hmm. He fights the Russians to a very bloody draw, mm -hmm. at which point Napoleon and Tsar Alexander say, look, we've got to sit down and talk about this. What we need, Napoleon says, look, what we need is an understanding. Mm -hmm. We need detente. And we need you, you know, I need you to help enforce the blockade against Britain. You know Britain's no good for you either. You know, and Alexander says, and I, I need you to stop. Mm -hmm. I need a red line. Napoleon says, you got one. Now, they have trouble. As we all know, it breaks down. It doesn't last very long. Correct. Alexander never really trusts Napoleon. Right. I think Napoleon did trust Alexander. But Talleyrand resigns. This is, his, this is his rationale. France has never firmly aligned herself to anybody else. Mm-hmm. We keep shifting our alliances as we need to. Mm -hmm. Right through the 18th century, for a while it was Prussia, for a while it was Austria. Britain's irreconcilable. Mm -hmm. And we've got to play our game around that. You know, we can't, um, we can't align ourselves only to Russia. Mm -hmm. So I'm going. Because I think you've treated the Austrians and the Prussians in such a way that it's going to be very difficult to build bridges to them again. Napoleon's actually, is, I've neutralized them. Right. And eventually they'll come around and they'll, they'll have to be my allies because they ain't got no choice. Right. And then when Talleyrand sees Spain going wrong, he gets friendly with Metternich, who at that time is the Austrian ambassador. Mm -hmm. Now, Talleyrand has a very rackety private life, to put it mildly. 
I, yeah. just want, I want to touch on his private life a little bit. I know he was a, a lover of luxury of the ladies, but he mm -hmm. was married, right, in 1802? Yeah, it was very much a marriage of convenience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he always had pretty high-profile mistresses. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, basically, he, you know, he was running several girlfriends. Um, he had a lot of debts. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd lost his job. Right. He, keep, he keeps the much better paid job of Grand Chamberlain. Napoleon won't let him leave court because he finds him very useful because he's right. an ancien regime courtier. Right. You know, he is, I mean, Napoleon himself kind of says this in his memoirs. I mean, you need people like Talleyrand, you need people like Josephine just to tell some of my generals not to, to, to take their hands out of their pockets. <laughs> and how you to know, act to, in court, right. Yeah. yeah. Just to you know, stop them stealing the silverware. Right. <laughs> well, that's what these guys do. Yeah. And, um, but when he's, and he, he, he thinks you know, Talleyrand knows people, you can't alienate him too much. Mm -hmm. But Talleyrand's got all that going. And once Talleyrand sees Spain going badly wrong, mm -hmm. then he starts to turn. I don't think Napoleon ever knew this. Mm -hmm. He becomes Metternich's informant. And when after the disaster of 1809, the Austrians think they can beat Napoleon because he'd be fighting on two fronts. Mm -hmm. And I think his greatest moment as a military commander was when he turns his army around in Spain, mm -hmm. gets it back into Central Europe, and the Battle of Wagram, he defeats the Austrians. Yeah, it's incredible. It's a three-day slog. It's a Gettysburg. Yeah. It's a three-day slog, but he won it. Yeah, he did. At a terrible price. Mm -hmm. But at that at that point, Metternich knows. He, he, after that debacle, he becomes the Austrian chancellor. And he knows that... On the one hand, he and Emperor Francis know. On the one hand, Napoleon is too strong to live with. Mm -hmm. We've got to just swallow hard and reconcile ourselves to him for the moment. But in the long term, that guy has to go. Right. Because right. that guy will not stop now. No, no, he, he knows no limits. He, well, he's got it in for It's not so much that. Yeah. I don't think they were worried about that so much. It's that, A, this guy... On the one hand, he's not afraid to depose somebody who he thinks has crossed it. Mm -hmm. So it could be us. Could be, you know, he 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 hates the Bourbons. He deposes, but most of all, it's it's not that he he, can, he he he'll go on and sort of conquer the world. It's that we know that his war machine is so powerful mm -hmm. that we can't oppose him. But he has, and that's why he's got to go. Yeah. Because you, we can't have, he does dominate Europe, and we can't have this go on. But Talleyrand becomes, when Metternich is back in Vienna, he says, all right, I need a line to Paris. Mm -hmm. And he becomes known as Monsieur X, Mr. X. Uh. Monsieur X. And he sends a lot of information to Talleyrand, he thinks. But where, I mean, but it's Metternich who's playing Talleyrand. Mm hmm because he's actually able to tell people he trusts, like the Archduke Charles, who's Emperor Francis's younger brother, that this guy, he knows, but he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. Because the real line of intelligence inside France is, are the Russians. Right. Alexander has two absolutely brilliant diplomats in Paris, mm -hmm. and nobody suspects them. Absolutely nobody. As, you know, one uh, of them is a very dashing, bizarre Cossack type guy. Mm -hmm. He's great with the girls. He can hold his drink. You mm -hmm. know, he's he's a great horseman. He's a great dancer, and nobody assumes he has a braid. And he's got the sharpest brain in in Europe. <laughs> you know what I mean? And all this is coming back to Alexander. I mean, Alexander knows when Napoleon's ill, right? You know, well, and he's getting back to Met and Met and you. Know, they can compare notes. The well, Metternich can say, "You know, Talleyrand. There's a lot that Talleyrand doesn't know." And and there's not it's not like Napoleon doesn't know that Talleyrand's up to shenanigans and and maybe you can clear up this story because it's, it's it might be apocryphal might not be true, but it's claimed that in front of Napoleon's marshals Napoleon does a famous dressing down of Talleyrand where he could quote break him like a gr a glass but it's not worth the trouble and uh, added that he was excrement in a silk stocking, did that ever happen or what's the story with that dressing down? Well, there is a dressing down. Mm -hmm. um, and it's more to do with Napoleon thinking he stepped out of line mm -hmm. um, than anything else. 
and it's more about suspicion mm -hmm. and it's a lot to do about this shady plot to overthrow him mm -hmm. I mean, even if it was a plot we don't know tally Rome was so cliche they're so careful mm -hmm. um it's more about that um than anything that actually happened it's tension mm -hmm. but i mean he never as far as i can tell very credible memoirs have said he never actually called him shit to stop stopping. <laughs> Much later, in 1812, when Napoleon's coming back from Russia and his, um, his traveling companion is, is Colin Kuhl, who is his foreign minister, who was his foreign minister, he's been through St. Petersburg, he knows Halley Rome quite well, doesn't he? Right, know. right. And Colin Kuhl so was the only, he's the only reliable account we have of that trip with Napoleon. And he said something not unlike that. Much yeah. later, and it yeah. was looking back on things. And it, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't part of the dressing down. Yeah, and it seemed Talleyrand respected Napoleon's brilliance. You know, quote: "Pity that so great a man should be should have been so badly brought up." End quote. Um, so I think he respected yeah. Napoleon, but like you said, there was he was doing in what his, in his mind what was right for France, not necessarily what was right for Napoleon. Well, I mean. Talleyrand's come to the conclusion, first of all, with Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't entirely idealistic. Mm -hmm. He's got himself into such a mess in Spain that he, he'll weaken himself in the long run. You know, this 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 is what's going to get him. So I'm I'm bailing out of Spain mm -hmm. and I've already bailed out of being foreign minister. Because I I already see I see the cracks here. Yeah. And I don't say, but he's already disagreed with him about trying to ally with Alexander. Mm -hmm. And yet that not long after the alliance is forged, Napoleon and Alexander meet again in Erfurt. Mm -hmm. And Talleyrand by then is convinced that Napoleon is getting things wrong. Mm -hmm. And he's, he thinks he's feeding news to Alexander. In fact, Alexander knows everything that Talleyrand's telling him. Talleyrand realizes that Alexander can turn around and tell Napoleon all this. Yeah. And so he starts so he starts working with the Austrians instead. Yeah, and um, even when Napoleon's away in Russia in 1812, there's the Malay conspiracy where Malay attempts to take yeah. over the government uh, kind of haphazardly, but uh, there is that attempt while Napoleon's off in Russia. Oh, yeah, there is. I mean, Talia has nothing to do with that. Yeah. You know, he, he knows when something is just bombed. <laughs> right. and, and, and Mali was for the birds. Right, right. You know, Mali was completely for the birds. Although, again, a lot of recent research, um, a very bright Dutch lady uh, do a, an undergrad, short undergraduate thesis with me. Mm -hmm. I think she she made a good case for saying that you know, the, the Mali coup was much more widespread than we'd thought. Mm -hmm. There was a lot more support for it, a lot more people involved in it. Mm -hmm. but none of them were high level. Right, right. You know, everybody at the higher level looks at this and says, look, you know, this is just daft. It's not going to get off the ground. Yeah. Um, you know, even even if you'd like it to happen, it won't. And Mali, of course, was a Republican mm -hmm. and wanted to declare for the Republic. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what someone like Talleyrand is going to support. Moving along the story, obviously, Napoleon is defeated in Russia due to weather and the army in Russia uh, losing um, almost all of its men. Uh War German, German Liberation, 1813, 1814, and Talleyrand in 1814 actually hosts the conquering Tsar Alexander in Paris. Um, yes, he does. Yeah, which obviously you can tell the two were in contact with each other. And he works on the peace negotiations in Vienna for France. Uh, he, I guess this is kind of his shiny moment, don't you think? It is within France. Mm -hmm. um, Alexander... Uh, his, his influence on Alexander is tenuous. Nobody really controls Alexander. He's yeah. a loose cannon. Yeah. And Talleyrand, I think, is dangerous. He thinks he can, but he can't. Right. Uh, it takes other people, other factors to win him around. Um, one of the things Talleyrand does do, Alexander has an idea that maybe France should become a republic again. Mm -hmm. Or that France should maybe have a national convention to, to decide it's a new constitution which everybody not just Talion tried to take credit but it isn't just him it's it's, it's guys like Metternich and Castlereagh mm -hmm. who pull him aside and said look at you, you know we were in the room we were alive at the time you don't do that that's how they got into this mess right 
Talleyrand's not in a position to say that. Right. Where Talleyrand is brilliant in 1814 is working the French, working the French side of things. Mm -hmm. He's kept his line open to Louis the mm Eighteenth. -hmm. Um, you know, he's he's kept um, he, he's 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 kept the ball in play. That, but he himself in 1814 is a real operator. What Talleyrand really is working for to begin with is a regency mm -hmm. for Napoleon's son. Mm -hmm with Talleyrand as the regent. Right. That's what he's working for. And where he's shrewd, where, where I think his golden moment comes as a political operator, is to see that, well, you weigh it up, he says, from inside France, the army will back this. Mm -hmm. The French army will buy this. Mm -hmm. But the Allies won't. You know, but he, he's, he's like, like Napoleon thinks that the Austrians will buy it because, of course, Napoleon's son is the grandson of, of Francis, the Austrian emperor. Right. And when it's clear to him that Metternich tells him, look, go and jump in the lake. <laughs> no Bonaparte's, right, mate? Right. I don't, I don't care whether they're medium-sized right. or pint-sized. Right. Uh, we, we, there are no Bonaparte's and none of them are staying in France. Yeah. And neither is Mary Louise, the Empress. Right. She's coming back to Vienna where I can keep an eye on her because she's gone native. Yeah, and, and I and know... And Talleyrand gets this. Right. And that, But that's when he's able to shift. And because Alexander's talking about all sorts of crazy things. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the Prussians have blood in their eyes. They don't care what happens as long as they get a piece of the action. Right. And, and I know... Ta Marshal Bernadotte had his eyes on the prize. That maybe well, that's a that's he does, but that's a different one. Right. He's he's a weak. He's a he has to rely on other people. Mm -hmm. And for a while, Alexander toyed with the idea. Mm -hmm. But Bernadotte was such a drag your feet, unreliable, lousy ally in the 18, 14, 13, 14 campaign. Right. Alexander has gone right off it. Right. Right. You know, he's, he's not going to act. You know, he said, Do you don't have to worry about Bernadotte. My boys were counting on Bernadotte to turn up. The Prussians were counting Bernadotte to turn up. All he cares about is keeping the Swedish army intact. Right. No, there is no way that guy is getting thrown. <laughs> Everybody says fine. And that's where Talleyrand can maneuver it mm -hmm. and say, what about a Bourbon restoration? Mm. Because but there's the, the fly in the ointment there is that for once, Fouché trumps him. It's Fouché and a few others who say, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. We can find a constitutional way to depose Napoleon. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, the, the original constitution of the empire was drawn on the Roman precedent that the Republic still exists. It's been entrusted to a hereditary emperor. Mm -hmm just like Rome, the Senate mm -hmm. and people of Rome. Well, the Senate and people of France and the Bonapartes only have the imperial title and all that in trust. If they endanger the Republic, the Senate can depose them. Right. Talleyrand, it's, it's, it's Fouché who gets enough support in the Senate mm -hmm. to do it. And he creates then a provisional government in Paris, mm -hmm. which Talleyrand is not actually part of mm -hmm. and says, we are the we are the real government of France. We are going to reach an armistice with the Allies, mm -hmm. which means that you can say to the army, very like in 1914 with the Germans, very like in 1940 with the French, we're not surrendering. Mm -hmm. There's an armistice. Right. Napoleon tries to trumpet and say, no. They've deposed me illegally. I'm the emperor. Right. I say we surrender. Mm -hmm. And it creates a whole conundrum. Talleyrand at that point says, okay, look, we've got to recognize the provisional government, but we've got to break the deadlock. Mm -hmm. And he's the one who says to Louis XVIII, you have got to issue a constitution before the provisional government does. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you what to do. Right. That's well, his big moment. Because at Vienna, yeah, he, at first, he can't get anywhere. Right. 
you know, when, when Napoleon reinvaded the Hundred Days, no one trusts the French. He opposes Napoleon completely. He's loyal to the Allies. Yeah. But he has the rug cut out from under him. We don't care what you think. Yeah. It, and and we don't. And Alexander turns around and says, and Castlereagh, don't think much to your Louis the Eighteenth. Right. And, he and, scuppered. He ran. <laughs> exactly. He did run. You, know, you would uh, get. You would. You would get me doing that. Alexander says you would get me doing that. Yeah. After the Hundred Days, the second peace agreement's a lot less lenient than the first one. Yeah. Um. You, and you would think, all right, well, Talleyrand's career is over. You know, it, it didn't go well for him in that negotiation, but that's not true. What what kind of becomes of him after Napoleon? Well, he again because he is in with Louis the Eighteenth, and Louis the Eighteenth sees he's at least been loyal, mm -hmm. and within France he's been very useful mm -hmm. because you know a lot of people in France who don't like Napoleon mm -hmm. don't like Louis either. And Talleyrand's been pretty influential in bringing sort of moderate revolutionaries back on side. Right. Um, and getting Fouché out of the way. Because Fouché supported, you know, the, the lot. he and Fouché worked together for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a very right-wing royalist government selected. They, they get rid of Fouché. Talleyrand has enough influence that he survives. He is very useful as an ambassador because of his contacts with Methodic and the English. Mm -hmm. Although obviously he's kind of powerless, but he's got he's got a good rapport with them. Inside France, he's very important at appeasing things. He picks up very important backing to begin with, because what a lot of people haven't thought about, and it's only now beginning to be studied in depth. And the archives are tremendous. I don't know why it's done before, but there's some very good. European scholars, particularly Dutch scholars, have a look at this. France was this foreshadows what happens after World War II. Mm -hmm. France is divided into zones of occupation after Waterloo, with you know an Austrian army here, a Prussian army there, an English army there, and Wellington is made the overall commander in chief mm -hmm. of the Allied occupation, sits in Paris, and when the French ultras, they call them, the very right wing royalists. Want to put the clock back, kill the Jacobins, execute everybody who executed Louis XVI. They have a certain amount of influence on Louis XVIII. Louis XVIII's brother, the future Charles X, he's a mover and a shaker among them. And Ta Talleyrand is very Talleyrand gets the backing of Wellington. You know, the backing of, mm -hmm. the, of the, the Allied High Command to say, "Look, Louis, you've got to distance yourself from these guys." Right. You've got to distance yourself from your brother. If you won't listen to me, you're going to have to listen to the British Army. And Wellington is fed up with you. Mm -hmm. And if Wellington blows the whistle, the Prussians, the Austrians, they're all set about us. Right. And you know, he, he's, again, with inside France, he's a great operator. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to dealing with the Congress of Vienna, who imposed very harsh terms on France, not just in terms of territory. That's what gets the headlines. They impose a very heavy indemnity on the French. Mm -hmm. And their armies of occupation, Prussian army, particularly vicious, the Prussians. Right. In the Northeast, particularly vicious occupiers. Mm -hmm. The Austrians down in the, the, the center in the Southeast who aren't so bad. The British in the West who aren't so bad. But it's taken a heavy toll. Mm -hmm. And it's actually Louis XVIII, not Talibon. No one will listen to Talleyrand. Mm -hmm. It's Louis XVIII who goes in there and really pulls himself together. It's his finest hour and says, look, nobody was more embarrassed or angry about the Hundred Days than me. Right. But this is my country and these are my people. And they are being oppressed. They just can't pay what you want them to pay. Right. You're going to have to reduce this. You're going to have to forget about it. Mm -hmm. And they do. That's who turns the tide for them and makes it livable. But those indemnities were still being paid in the 1820s. Yeah. That's a and long, there was nothing Talleyrand could do about that. It's a long time. What he does do when he's foreign minister is there's a revolution, there are revolutions in Spain and in Naples and in Piedmont in 1821, mm -hmm. which have... French revolutionary Napoleonic tendencies mm -hmm. that, that really unsettle all the powers of Europe. Mm -hmm. 
And Talleyrand is very shrewd and instrumental in getting France reintegrated and saying, look, uh, because Alexander is jumping up and down, Russia is the big power in Europe right. after 1814, not Britain. Right. Alexander is a huge army and it's still kicking around in eastern France, western Germany. Mm -hmm. And Alexander says, leans on the French and says, I want free passage to take a Russian army into Spain and sort this out. Mm -hmm. And everybody goes gulp. Nobody wants this. Right. So between them, Metternich and Talleyrand work a very good move. Metternich says, Austria will handle Italy. Mm -hmm. Don't need the Russians. And Talleyrand says, will you trust me to raise a French army to put down Spain? Right. Now, this is the revival of French militarism mm -hmm. after Napoleon. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the would be like the revival of German militarism in the 1950s. Yeah. You know, to deal with something. Mm -hmm. And, um, okay, he, he pulled it off. Yeah, it's, it was successful. And the, Amazing. the French went in, they were successful. Yeah. Yeah. And that means France could be trusted. Yeah. Well, you know, that's his famous, That's his, I think that's his last great thing. Yeah. And, and he it, placed the right cards in the Revolution of 1830 as well. Yeah. And, you know, he goes on to serve, uh, you know, different governments in France. Different well, countries. Louis Philippe, who becomes king uh, in 1830, was the, um, he was the cousin of Louis XVIII. Mm hmm and uh, he's the cadet branch of the family. And in, in, the, in, in 1814 and in 100 days, Talleyrand was very good at keeping his lines open to Louis Philippe. Mm -hmm. And for a long time saying, okay, you don't want a regency, how about Louis Philippe? Mm -hmm. He doesn't get away with it uh, at that time. And he sees very quickly, this won't run, and then switches to, to Louis XVIII and the Bourbons because he knows that's what everybody else will, will go for. Right. But he sees his chance in 1830, and he's one of the very instrumental guys in the crisis in getting Louis Philippe made king. Mm. So great survivor. Yeah, indeed. Um, he Talleyrand passes in 1838, um, yeah. so eight, eight years later. Yeah. What do you think his legacy is? And I know that's a tricky question because it has been said that, you know, the phrase, he's a Talleyrand, is variously used by, you know, diplomats to describe a statesman of great resourcefulness and ingenuity yeah but you say he's kind of overrated as a statesman what, what do you think, think he was what do you think his legacy is i think one of, i think his legacy well there's the legend of talleyrand mm -hmm. you know if you're a smooth operator if you've got polish if you're old school mm -hmm. you can survive most crises mm -hmm. you know napoleon was fascinated by him even though he didn't trust him Mm -hmm. because he could bring that bit of old world charm and manners into a pretty rough and ready world. Right. Um, I think part of his legacy, especially within France, was simply his experience. He'd been through everything you could be through. Mm -hmm. With the revolution, with Napoleon, with the 100 days, with the restoration, uh, with the crisis of, of the 1820s. And when he gave advice... Um, it was seasoned by experience. Yeah. He knew what he was talking about. He'd been there. He'd done that. Right. Um, right. I think that's part of it. I think the other thing was he had a kind of a commitment to a liberal, moderate parliamentary, elitist but parliamentary regime for France. Mm -hmm. A belief in constitutions that were elitist. Um, that um, you know with the small electorates that he stuck by I mean that's the one he, he favors um, you know in, in 1796 that's the rabbit he pulls out of the hat in 1814 that's the one he stands by against right-wing extremism in 1815 right and again in 1830 and the one he sees to come to fruition in 1830 mm -hmm. backing that kind of moderate elitist, constitutional monarchy i think that the fact that he kept that afloat um i think is is, is part of, he's a very important part of that legacy indeed yeah all right well that was some overview michael i really oh, appreciate 
appreciate it. That was amazing. Thank you so much for that. My pleasure. My pleasure, John. It's been yeah. a pleasure in every way. Yeah, no, and I uh, thank you for being on the show. And um, yeah, I would love to have you back sometime. That was fabulous. Be a pleasure.